thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to give a talk here. Uh, I hope uh, not to disappoint you and to be as exciting as it can get in Friday. Uh, so my talk would be on uh, quantum graphs and the nodal count and nodal, nodal count and the statistical behavior of the nodal count of the eigenfunctions on, ca on quantum graphs. And specifically, I'm going to talk about the conjecture of some kind of a universal behavior, universal limit. Uh, this talk is based on a on few works with uh, Ram Band uh, from the Technion, my advisor, and Gregory Bekoraiko from Texas A&M. That's you. So I'll just uh, start from a very brief, superficial uh, introduction to nodal count. And it initially, the, the Dirichlet problem, we're looking at, uh, at a bounded domain in R2. We're looking at the Laplacian, which is just the second derivative, the sum of the second derivatives. We want to look at eigenproblem with Dirichlet boundary condition. Under this uh, situation, we get a sequence of uh, a, sec a complete set of solutions ordered according to their eigenvalues. And we can talk about, for each one of those eigenfunctions, uh, we get a partition of the, of the domain that we started with uh, to different domains on which it has a constant sign. Uh, these are what we call the nodal domains. And the nodal count would be the number of nodal domains. And at least heuristically, our physical motivation would be that as we go up in the spectrum, we, we, we believe that we'll get more and more nodal domains because the waves are supposed to oscillate very fast. Uh, but in general, uh, it's very hard to say uh, global statements about that, about that problem. So the first, uh, the first mathematical statement was by Courant in 1923 saying that the new n is upper, is as an upper bound by n. And I t it will be convenient to write it like this uh, in order to say that Pliel, uh, thir 30 years later, uh, proved that although some eigenfunctions do satisfy the a current bound exactly have, have an equality here, but from a certain point onwards, asymptotically this doesn't happen, and it's actually bounded by something which is appro approximately 0 0.69. Uh, here it's the first uh, zero of the zeros Bessel function, and this bound, by the way, is is not uh, strict, and in, in a work in the last decade of uh, both uh, Stefan Steinberger and Bourguin, uh, they showed, just following the proof of Pliel and improving some of the arguments there, that this, can, this bound is not strict. They actually gave uh, a better bound, but a better in the sense of 10 to the minus 9. So just, uh, just to say that, that you can do better, it is believed to be actually bounded by 2 over pi, uh, which is approximately 0 0.63. And at this point, if uh, we're, where is that well, I will show that in, in a minute. At this, at this point, I would say this is, not the, this is not what I'm going to talk about, but you can't go here without saying that, in general, we don't even know if nu n goes to infinity. Uh, with n, and the, these kind of questions were answered in different settings, not the Dirichlet problem and not the Euclidean case, but for example by Peter and uh, that they talked about uh, a, a, a hyperbole. The fact that that doesn't get any sympathy with some by students or students, Yeah, so so. So the, the, the classical example, if, I, if we already mentioned it, so the classical example is if we take the torus and generally if we take separable eigenfunctions, so the nodal structure would be some kind of a checkerboard like that, where say that black would be, posi the, the 
places where the function is positive and white would be the places where the function is negative. And then if you perturb a bit, take some linear combinations of, uh, of them, then you can break this into some sort of this pattern. And then we only get two nodal domains, although it's something very high in the spectrum. So heuristically, this is what, what kind of a pathology can go wrong. And then we're going to the next historical uh, step, which is a work, a numerical work, on quantum chaos uh, by Galia Bloom, Sven Gnutzman, and Uzi Smilansky uh, from uh, Weizmann Institute that said, OK, let's look, at about, let's look at this quantity and see how it behaves. Uh, this is something that is bounded between 0 and 1. We believe that it's bounded much more than that. And we want to see how it behaves. And what, what, they, what they discovered numerically is that it's actually a, an indicator for quantum chaos and that it has two kinds of behaviors. One behavior is if we're looking at an integrable domain. Here, the red one is a circle. The blue one is a rectangle. Uh, then you get this really nice shape, peaked. Where, the, where it has some kind of uh, bound from the right, and the bound from the right for the rectangular one, it's something that, people, that we can actually calculate. This is the 2 over pi. And this is, according the, to a conjecture by uh, Yosif Polterovich, is the bound, is the true uh, Pleyel bound. Again, a conjecture. Uh, the main thing is that for chaotic domains, which is the interesting thing where we really don't have any machinery to, to usually calculate, uh, it is believed that it's concentrated around some certain value. And this, all, this is something that they saw numerically, but no one ever proved it analytically until 2009, where Sodin and Azarov uh, took some kind of uh, random wave models, something that origin to Michael Berry, where uh, in this case they looked, at, uh, they looked at a sphere, they looked at the spherical harmonics, they took uh, linear combinations of spherical harmonics with Gaussian random coefficients, and for that they showed something which is analog to what I write here, which is that this nu, of, nu n over n concentrates around a certain positive value and they even gave some kind of uh, exponential decay. So this whole brief introduction was to say two things. First, the nodal statistics, uh, it seems, at least from this conjecture, that it plays a role in describing the chaoticity of a system and maybe even saying something about the connection between the classical behavior and the quantum behavior. And the second thing is that it's a very hard question. If it hasn't, we, we haven't been able to touch those simple questions yet. Uh, so what we're going to do is take this question from a different angle and look at a different object, which is quantum graphs. Now, quantum graphs also emerged. Yeah. So just integral and chaotic domains. Yeah. OK. So, so Again, it's, it's not like it's just the motivation, so I won't get really into that. But uh, if you're there, it, it's one of those things that are very, very not well defined uh, what is integrable and what is chaotic. But uh, you can think about the, about the classical trajectories of uh, the, cla the classical trajectories uh, when you think about a particle just going in straight line and then bouncing from the edge, bouncing from the boundary uh, with uh, reflection. And you can say that for certain domains, uh, you can have periodic orbits in some sort of a, uh, a de in, in a dense set of, uh, of uh, starting conditions. And if, if you have a rectangle, that it would be integrable. And the classical example is the stadium, where it is chaotic. Or if you just look at the 
rectangle and take out a piece, then it would be chaotic, and most of the stuff would be chaotic. This relates. And now it's interesting because this is like a, a classical mechanic point of view where you're just looking at the initial at the uh, momentum and uh, location, and then you're saying, if I if I look the the, ana the quantum analog for that would be exactly the would be exactly the Dirichlet problem, and then you want to say whether I in the quantum setting whether I have something that can give me a separation between these two cases. And the first thing that people believe is doing that, and it's still, uh, it's still a conjecture in many situations, is the level spacing statistics. Uh, so you're looking at the spectrum, you're looking at the statistics of the difference between uh, one eigenvalue and the next eigenvalue, and whether this has a Poissonian distribution or a distribution that fits to the level statistics of a Gaussian uh, matrix ensemble, this would give uh, a criteria for chaoticity. So if I already mentioned that, so when Uzi Smilansky worked on that, on, on those kind of uh, problems, uh, he looked for, uh, for a nice model where you can actually do computations because if you take something which is chaotic, by definition it would be very hard to compute uh, things, and this is where quantum graphs uh, got first into the picture. Uh, let's say, if we don't, if we exclude uh, the fact that uh, Fowling defined it in the 1930s. Uh, <laughs> so, let me. What? What's the name? Uh, Fowling. I can I can <laughs> show you later. But the, the main thing, he, he thought it would be a good way to describe molecules where most of the activity of the electron will be just passing from one atom to the other. So you're just thinking about a wave traveling along a wire. And then it turned out that the tight binding model and stuff like that were much better. Uh, so now just to give you a glimpse of what do I think by when I say a quantum graph. So we have here these this network of wires, and we have some kind of a function, a wave function uh, going along this network. Mm -hmm. Here what you see, I started with some Gaussian and let it evolve using Schrodinger equation. And we're looking at the amplitude square of the eigenfunction. This is just to see that there's, there is some kind of a, a complexity that you won't find in standard one-dimensional uh, lines. Uh, so. Just, to just some nice demonstration. So now let's talk about a quantum graph. So by definition, I'm, I'm starting with a metric graph. F, uh, e would be the set of edges, V set of uh, vertices. I'm taking, each e I'm taking the edges and I'm, uh, I'm attaching them by the endpoints according to the vertices. And each edge has a certain length, a positive number. Uh, the graph is not necessarily a simple graph. So I, I, allow, uh, I allow loops, as you see here, and I can have um, multi-edges. Uh, along, along the talk, when I say cycle, I, I mean a closed simple path. When I say loop, I mean edge connecting a vertex to itself. So it's a particular case of a cycle. So example, as example here, I have two loops. And the main thing here is that when, when I talk about functions on a quantum graph, I don't want you to think about just a weighted graph or something like that. The functions are functions on each one of the edges, just function on the edge, and I attach them with some kind of conditions, uh, compatibility conditions on the vertices. So under this construction, I can talk about the Laplacian edgewise. So on each interval, I have the Sobolev space and the L2 space, and I'm looking at the sum of them, and I have this operator that act, act edgewise, and up to this point, this operator is not self-adjoint yet. I need to say something about the compatibility on the vertices, and I will go with the easiest example of vertex conditions, which is the Neumann, sometimes called Kirchhoff vertex conditions, 
where I demand that the eigenfunction would be uh, continuous on the vertices and the sum of incoming derivative vanish. So this would give that the probability current would satisfy a Kirchhoff law. So to wrap it up together, when I say a standard quantum graph, I mean a metric graph, finite and connected, Laplace operator. I don't want to add uh, at this point uh, potentials. And Neumann vertex conditions, of course, you can have much, much more sophisticated quantum graphs. You can have different vertex conditions. That's not for this talk. Uh, in addition, I will assume that I have more than one edge. This graph is not trivial. And this is a particularly interesting thing that I'm going to demand, and I hope that those of you that puzzle why is this here would eventually in, in a few, in up to 10 to 15 minutes would understand why is this here. I will assume that the edge lengths are independent over the rational, meaning that I cannot take a sum of the edge length with coefficients in the rational to get zero. Your functions are moving from the vertices or from no, 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 no. So, This is how the functions look like, okay? okay? Totally on the edges. The, the one-dimensional singular manifold. Right? So the very one-dimensional. Yeah. Uh, the, thing, the thing that makes it interesting is that our vertex can be like this, and the boundaries are different. Exactly. Uh, so just properties, the, Laplaci the Laplacian itself a joint under this. We have a discrete spectrum, uh, non-negative. We always have the zeroth eigenvalue to be zero with the constant eigenfunction. We have an orthonormal basis of real eigenfunctions. And we will usually uh, talk about the square root of the eigenvalue and not the, uh, not the eigenvalue. Uh, it is much more convenient. Uh, so here, our example that we, sh that we saw before, and here are just a couple of eigenfunctions, the, the lower eigenfunctions and numbered according to the spectral position. You can get a feeling of how when you go up in the spectrum, you get more and more oscillations. These are nice waves. And now I can define the nodal count. So what is a nodal count? I have the, I'm just counting the number of points where the eigenfunction vanish. Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, if there's only one edge getting to that point, you will have normal conditions. Exactly, right? exactly. Exactly. And if you have just a guy and uh, if you have, you have two guys coming in, you can you prove that. Yeah, you can exactly. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So throughout the everything, I assume no vertices of degree two because I can just remove them. And now this is equivalent to counting nodal domains up to a shift. Uh, so it would be easier to just count the points where the eigenfunction vanish. And it is well defined only if fn is generic. When I say generic, I mean satisfy the two things. First, I want the eigenvalue to be simple, non-degenerate. Otherwise, I don't know which eigenfunction I'm talking about. And second, I want that my eigenfunction doesn't vanish on vertices, because I don't want to try to explain how do I count the zero on a vertex. With multiplicity or not, throw it away. And a theorem that actually I only I only put here the the last uh, the last two works that actually concluded that, but it's a, a sequence of many works uh, gives the bound on the nodal count. So the upper bound is exactly current bound. This is the shift just because we don't count nodal domains. And beta here. That's an inter interesting thing. It's the first Betty number of the graph. That's number of cycles that I have on the graph. And this would play an important role throughout this talk. And what's different than all cases of manifold that we have also a lower bound. So it's very clear what is the asymptotic of this guy. The asymptotics is N. That's because it's one dimensional. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's, it's obvious, it's not, it's up to some kind of uh, implicit, 
And we have some kind of implicit functions, but we can, we can work with that. But the main thing is that we still have here some kind of a bounded deviation, which is the thing we're after and trying to look how this bounded deviation would, uh, would oscillate. And so this bounded deviation, we call it the, the nodal surplus. And throughout this talk, when, I, when I'm talking about the nodal statistic, I'm actually talking about the statistics of this, uh, of this deviation. And now I just have to, to be honest about something. And <laughs> there, there is a, the, I have to, I have to. That's, that's, I'm a mathematician, I'm not a physicist. I, uh, I have a possible pathology here that uh, in the case where I, I do allow loops, I can have eigenfunctions supported on that loop. So if before we, lock, we looked up to the 11th eigenfunction, here the 12th eigenfunction, suddenly it's just a sine wave and zero everywhere else. And it's not something that I can throw away because it's something that happens generically. Uh, so for any loop, there are infinitely many eigenfunctions localized on that loop. And using some while uh, law asymptotics, I can actually tell you what is what is their density among the spectrum, which is what I'm going to do now. So first, in order to actually talk about estimates and qu quantitative est estimates, I want to, to talk about the following tool, which is the natural density. So this is our way, in order to say statements like half of the integers are odd, you need some kind of uh, way to measure that. So this is our way of measuring that. Theorem that says the following: If we start with a quantum, with a standard quantum graph, and say that this curly G would be the indices of the generic eigenfunctions among the spectrum, and the curly L will be the indices of the eigenfunctions supported on a loop. And I remind you, generic means that you have a simple eigenvalue, non-degenerate, and the eigenfunction doesn't vanish on vertices. So if if it's generic, I can define the nodal count. And what we say is that the densities exist, that's a very non-trivial statement, and equals, so again, the, the loop eigenfunctions, I can just calculate it using some kind of a while asymptotics, and... No, 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 no. If I, if I assume generic, I can, I can go over from having density one to having almost everything. No, 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 no. I, I'm saying. I want the condition on the length. The condition on the length, the condition of the length is rationally independent. Nothing more. Nothing more. I can add a bit more and stay in a residual set of edge lengths where everything here happ happens every time and not almost surely. But that's a. Uh, uh, so the main issue here that I want you to, to see is that rather than what. Uh, everything that is not a loop eigenfunction is generic. So it's the complement to one. In specific, if we, if we have no loops, then we have no loop eigenfunctions, so the density is one. And this can be summarized to the following, given a standard quantum graph, almost every non-loop eigenfunction is generic, and we can talk about the nodal count. So this is just to justify what I'm doing. Now let's talk about the main results. So first, first thing is that if we start with a quantum graph, these are zero up to beta, the, the possible values of the nodal surplus. And for each one of them, I can, look about, uh, I can look at all of the generic indices for which sigma n is equal to j. And I'm telling you, these sets has density. Moreover, the density of sigma n being equal to j is the density of sigma n being equal to beta minus j. So I have here some kind of uh, inversion. So sigma n, that's the nodal surplus. That's, the, the, that's how many nodal points I have further than n. Okay. And beta is the first beta number of the graph. Now, just to make it, uh, to, to to make the statements a bit uh, nicer, 
I would just uh, define some kind of auxiliary uh, random variable that gets these values with these probabilities. And then what I have is that this random variable is symmetric around beta over 2. So first, that's, that's a statement that we cannot do. All this is something that we cannot do for the planar domains. So that's already an achievement. But now, just this symmetry tells us that we know something about the average nodal surplus, which is beta over 2. So we actually have some kind of an inverse problem. So if I'm just given the nodal count sequence of a standard quantum graph, and let us for a minute assume we have no loops, then I can get its first Betty number by just averaging this uh, nodal surplus. So this may resolve isospectral problems. I would say that in a, in a different uh, work that we have, in which we count not the nodal points, but the points of maximum and minimum, uh, we have uh, a surprising result where instead of getting the first Betty number, we get, uh, we get the number of uh, vertices of degree 1. So these are exactly the ones that you said that get actually Neumann. So, it, so actually, if you count the number of, uh, if, you, if you look at the normalized number of uh, minimize and maximas, and you average it out, you get this, the number of boundary points. But that's for a different talk. So, what what's what? What kind of what type of conditions you are putting on the shape of the graph? Because none at all. None at all. Only that the edge lengths uh -huh. are rationally independent. Because last time I talked with Greg, and he was talking about graphs composed of, of cycles and uh, edges connecting those. We will get to those. Oh, yeah. That's those are a simple example, uh, a, a specific example. Uh, so here, let us just look at some examples. So here in these examples, you see uh, histograms, uh, normalized histograms of the, first, uh, of the first million eigenfunctions for each one of those graphs with some kind of uh, choice of uh, edge length. And you can see that, uh, first of all, they're different. Second of all, some of them, the, there are values that you don't attain. And it's uh, a property that if you attain a certain value in the sequence, you attain it infinitely many times. So if the, and in, with a positive density. So if you have a zero density, it means that you actually never see this value in the spectrum. And it comes from a certain symmetries. Yeah, that, that's, that's where, and that's where, again, the linear independent of, uh, of the edge lengths would exactly tells you that there is some kind of ergodicity argument in the background. So now let us look at an example for a bit larger graphs. And I really tried here to, to give you di very different graphs. So here we have uh, the lattice modulus 6 uh, with beta equal to 37. Here we, uh, I just uh, sampled uh, erdos rheny graphs. Uh, until I got something which was connected and just. Wait, wait, wait. Um, now you're taking a, a little graph and then you're putting many independent that you just choose. Yeah, I just choose. I take a graph, I put some kind of uh, linear independent edge length, so, uh, length the, uh, and calculate the first million eigenfunctions and their nodal count. And, and I'm also going there, but yeah. Uh, no, it's a theorem for part of the places. Uh, the, the main thing that I want you to get from, this, from these pictures is that they kind of look the same. And unlike these pictures, these pictures kind of look the same. And the only way that this one is different than this one is because of the symmetry. So. number of edges minus number of vertices plus one. That's, you can think about it just like that. The bed, a better way to think about it is uh, the dimension of the homology, the dimension of the first homology. And this would play a role when we talk about magnetic, uh, about magnetic fields, because that's actually going to be the dimension of all possible magnetic fields. Uh, but yeah. Uh, 
No, the surplus? The domain is just a, a boundary ah. point. Yeah. Is there any relationship? Yeah, yeah, the, the relation is just when you're up, you, when you're up enough in the spectrum, uh, then the relation is just a shift by beta. That's if you, if we go back to this one, so here if I would count no nodal domains, this would be n and non n plus beta. And this is exactly the current bound. Okay? So I'm going backwards. Too much? Where was I? Here. So we saw these examples. And this leads me to the following conjecture that uh, we believe that if the graph is large enough, we have beta much larger than 1, then the nodal subplot distribution would be kind of Gaussian around beta over 2 in the following sense. So take a family of standard quantum graph with sp first beta numbers growing to infinity. And in the conjecture, we don't assume nothing about those graphs, just rationally independent edge length. Whatever topology, whatever edge lengths you want, just take them such that the beta number will go to infinity. Then the normalized nodal count distribution would converge to Gaussian distribution, convergence in distribution where beta goes to infinity. So this, it looks like a central limit theorem, only we don't have here a sum of random variables. And this leads me to, to the following uh, theorem, the first time where we actually can show that this univer universality holds. And that's what you mentioned, the edge-separated graphs. So let me draw here just uh, a cartoon of what I'm, what I'm saying. So what I want you to think about is actually a tree of cycles. So assume that we have something like that. And we have some kind of a graph where whenever we have two cycles, there is at least one edge you can remove in order to distinguish them, to disconnect them. So these, these families of graphs, we can show that they have binomial distribution. And it's actually not showing with, ac with actually calculation, but showing with a lot of symmetries that we can produce that it has to be binomial. And the binomial is exactly what converged to the Gaussian. Uh, it also gives us an estimate on the variance, which is in the binomial case is beta over 4, and we believe that the, in general the variance is of order beta. Right. Yeah. No, 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 no. The distribution is, the, the spectrum goes to infinity. The distribution is over all eigenfunctions. For a given graph, a given given graph, graph uh, which is of this type, it's binomial. Could be very small. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly the, the situation where we saw, and that's the binomial. Uh, a proposition, not something that we're now working on, is to extend this to a slightly bigger family of graphs, which is vertex separated. So if I'm allowing myself to have something like this, then here I have cycles that have a vertex in common that I need to, to remove. So it's a, it's a slightly bigger family. And for vertex separated, I actually need to demand that I have no loops. If before I had loops, here, here I had loops, here I need to demand that I have no loops. And we prove that. And as a counterexample, just to see what happens if there are loop, if we just take the two flower, just the figure eight graph, so just this graph of two loops, then we can actually calculate and see that the nodal count would be always, the, the nodal uh, surplus would be always one and not binomial. So we really need this restriction of no loops. Now let us talk about, so these are the only cases we, where we can actually calculate the nodal distribution. And it's already an, a big achievement to actually calculate something like that. Usually we cannot calculate, but in some situations we were able to say that 
to bound it away from something and take it to take it uh, to to the universal limit. So we were able to show that these families of graphs has a universal uh, Gaussian limit. So I'll start with this one, uh, what, which we call Mandarin, just two vertices and a lot of, ver a lot of edges be between them, which should be like the nemesis of this guy. So it's exactly the, if here we have every two cycles are spread away, here we have all the, side, all the cycles are smashed together into as, as close as they can. Uh, so this was our first uh, thing that we did. Here we used heavily the fact that the underlying graph, if we forget about the edges, is uh, edge, uh, it has its edge transitive. Here we can show that, by the way, I didn't say, but here it's edge length dependent. So here you can see that the, the distribution is edge length depend independent, but usually the distribution does depend on the edge length, but in a very small way. Here we can show that the distribution doesn't depend on the edge length. This led to the following, uh, where we, we actually used the same symmetries to, to prove uh, for this family of graphs. Towers mean both stars and flowers. So this is star, this is, this is star, this is a flower, and that's a merge of them. I didn't invent that. <laughs> and then we wanted to see if this can be extended further, and we talked about mandarin and adding them a tail just to break the symmetry. We were able to solve it, but it, it was very clear that this cannot be fully extended uh, from that point of view. So, no, 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 no. I said that if you have vertex se separated with no loops, you have binomial distribution. Here you don't have binomial distribution. You just have a limit of Gaussian distribution. So what happens here actually is a binomial distribution plus a finite rank perturbation. And we can show that when, when you normalize it and take to the limit to infinity, the finite rank doesn't, doesn't do anything and you get the, the universal behavior. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, so for, for the flowers, can you give uh, an inherent explicitly or for the purple plant, for the inherent? Ag again? An explicit uh, distribution? No, no. I, I have, I have, uh, I can, I have a f uh, an explicit way of writing eigenfunctions and their nodal count, but I don't have a way of measuring the explicit the distribution. I have. I can I can do it with some kind of uh, integral form, but not not in the way that here it's a binomial. What do you have for complete graphs? Do you still have the main distribution for those? This one? Yeah. So do you include that and also convert it to? Not yet. Not yet. That that's what what I'm. Uh, it's numerically yes. Uh, analytically, that's all we have. Okay, uh, what we aim to do, we hope uh, that maybe interpolating between this and this in some way would give everything. Uh, but actually, the proof of the vertex separated, so I, I really want to go to the proof of the edge separated graphs, but the proof of, of the vertex separated graph is a totally different proof and uh, not going through all the symmetries that I'm going to show you, but actually has a much, much more uh, physical intuition behind it. Uh, okay, so let's talk about method and proof. And the first thing, as we said, there should be some kind of ergodicity argument in the background. Uh, so the first, the first thing we want to do is uh, go to some kind of an algebraic uh, problem. And that's, uh, an approach of uh, scatterings that go back to von Bello from 85 and then Kotos and Smilansky from 98. And it says that if we, we start with a standard quantum graph, uh, we have a certain uh, trigonometric polynomial, real trigonometric polynomial from Re, number of edges, to R, uh, which we call the secular function. And it captures the zeros of the secular, of the secular functions, function captures the spectrum. 
in the following way, that this thing would vanish. This is a function of k. The L's are fixed. k varies from 0 to infinity. And whenever it's a 0, I get an eigenvalue. And it's including the multiplicity. And moreover, the secular function depends only on the structure of the graph, but not on the edge length. So the whole thing, the, the whole uh, dependence on the edge length just getting to this picture. So let's look at this nice picture. This is, this is the, the picture for a certain graph with two edges. So we can do it on a, so we, ha we have this uh, periodic, these blue lines, which are the zero set of some kind of a trigonometric polynomial. And it's periodic both in x and in y, in 2 pi periodic. And now we have this line. This is where I'm, instead of putting x1, x2 up to xe, I'm putting this k times the l vector. So that's just a straight line for k goes from 0 to infinity. Whenever I hit the blue, the, the black line hit the blue line, I get an eigenvalue. Now, we don't like to work with infinite stuff, so we mod out the periodicity. We go to the flat torus, and we define this nice uh, manifold. It's actually an algebraic variety, which is the zero set of this, uh, of this uh, function. And now we say that KL modulo 2 pi lies in sigma, this variety, uh, if and only if K squared is an eigenvalue. So this variety we call the secular manifold. And, I'm, and we're going to do all of our calculations on the secular manifold. And now is the time that's the, where the, the bell rings and you finally understand why did I took the edge rings to be rationally independent. So here what happens if I, I had this line going to infinity, but now I'm taking modulo 2 pi in all directions. And this line starts to wrap around the torus. And if my edge lengths are rationally independent, which is the direction, then it's going to round around and never come back to the, self, to the same point and actually cover the torus densely. So the points of hitting this boundary, this manifold, are going to be equidistributed according to some measure. And this is a work that started, initiated by Barain Gaspard when they were trying to show something about the level spacing distribution. So this picture kind of uh, explain what happens. I'm getting uh, more and more and more, the trajectory go goes and more and more and more and stops wraps around the torus. And eventually, I would get some kind of a measure that tells me, if I have a set, how many times I, I lie, on average, I lie inside this set. And it would be according to this measure. This is this measure. And this is the theorem, the ergodic theorem. Uh, and just to, you can stir a bit for a minute, but now let's go to a, a, lighter, a lighter version of this. Uh, oh, Exactly. So I'm just taking, <laughs> I, I'm just. Yeah, so, so, that, so, so ev eventually, and that's actually all I need, is that if I have, I'm just, instead of looking at Riemann integrable function, I'm just looking at indicators of, uh, of sets. And all I, all I want to say is that if I have an integer set, of an integer set of all those points where the, the corresponding points on the manifold lie inside A. So this integer set going to have a density, meaning this, this limit exists. And this limit is going to be the measure. So this is how we, this is how we use the rational independence in order to say something about those densities. and and to calculate them. By the way, you could, in general, you could take the torus, which is the, which is the closure of this line. Yeah, that, 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 that's exactly that if, that, that's exactly if, if, I'm, if they're not independent, if they're, they have some kind of a rank, uh, then it would be the subtorus according to that. But that's. 
No, it's, it's a, the, the trigonometric polynomial that we start with has a very certain structure. Uh, that's actually wh wh what uh, most of the work is, the massage of this. Uh... Okay, so the next thing uh, I want to talk about is the inversion, uh, which you can think about it as a time reversal. So taking a certain point to minus its point, so if I'm starting with this purple set, I would take just minus the purple set, I would land here, and that's going to be an isometry of this uh, isometry of this manifold, and it's going to preserve my measure. So once I have something which is measure preserving, it means that the measure of a certain set A would be the measure of the certain set minus A. And this would exactly mean that the density of these guys would be the density of these guys. And why do I call it time reversal? Because taking this point on the torus, setting it to minus the point on the torus, is like taking k and setting it to minus k, which is what we do in time reversal symmetry. So under these uh, two uh, methods that I just showed you, we have, a certain, uh, we have a certain sketch of a proof. So if we now can partition our uh, manifold into sets up to, measure, up to measure zero, such that each, each set, you the point lying inside AJ, if and only if sigma n is equal to J, then I won. Then I show that the density of sigma n equal to J is well defined. And if I show that AJ is minus A beta minus J, then I also got my symmetry. So this is what, what I'm aiming for. This is like the, the picture for this guy. So this is the manifold that you're seeing. That's actually only the generic part. All the parts where you have a loop eigenfunction, I, I throw them away. So this is the generic part. And this generic part, you can see it's very, it's, it's actually ordered here in a very nice way where you can see the binomial structure comes from. So the binomial structure exactly tells you that each one of those squares uh, has the same measure. And you can see that the blue is exactly minus of the red, uh, which is the inversion. So everything works out on this picture, only we just have to specify how we get those, those sets. Because here I need something which is analytically dependent on the edge lengths, and doing something like that on the nodal count is horrible. Yeah, the model. Oh, sorry. I, I'm. I'm. I. I so I'm sorry. That's. Uh, I, I'm not a number theorist. So I'm very not used to those uh, to those kind of notation. <laughs> OK, so uh, here are some more examples for different graphs. And now I want to get to, to, to the interesting part, if, if I may, and saying, how do I get those, uh, how do I get those, uh, those sets? And to do that, I need to go to a totally different story. And I need to talk about magnetic quantum graph. And because I don't have enough time here, I won't explain how why, this, why the thing that I'm talking about here is actually a magnetic quantum graph. Uh, so I'm just going to describe it. So just if we have a standard quantum graph, uh, we can choose a set of parameters uh, on the torus, on the beta torus. And there exi we can find beta points. In this case, I have two points where I can cut them, and the graph, be the graph becomes a tree. And on these points, I'm going to put some kind of uh, vertex condition that depends on alpha. And the vertex condition is that I'm going to jump when I go from one, to, from one side of this point to the other side. I'm going to jump by e to the i alpha. Here, the derivative as well. The minus is because I'm taking incoming derivative. But if you're, if you're thinking about the derivative in this direction, then it's just both the value and the derivative jump with e to the i alpha. And this 
uh, is actually unitary equivalent to having uh, just uh, to, to just inserting some magnetic potential where alpha is the alpha is the integral modulo 2 pi of the magnetic potential on this uh, on this cycle so that's just a toy example uh, which is unitary it's a toy model which is unitary equivalent to the actual model of uh, to the actual model of uh, a magnetic quantum graph and the main issue here is that now I have the eigenvalues. I'm starting with a standard quantum graph. I, I'm inserting uh, magnetic uh, parameters. And now the eigenvalue as a function of this magnetic parameter is real analytic as long as I don't get degeneracies, as long as I don't get two bands touching. So in this picture, each band is the eigenvalue as a function of the magnetic parameters. This would be the zero the zero eigenvalue the first, second, three, four, fifth eigenvalue. And this nice picture, it it's, can be related, I can talk about it later if anyone wants, to a dispersion relation manifold of a periodic, infinite periodic graph. And what I want you to notice here is that all the points in the middle, these are the points where the flux is equal to zero, are critical points. And when we talk about critical points, I want to classify them according to their Morse index. So I would say that a critical point has a Morse index. I would, I would denote it like that, the index of lambda n at the critical point. This is simply the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian, or to how many directions it can go down. So in this situation, here, 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 and here, it's all a minimum. It's a minima. So the Morse index is zero. Here I'm on a saddle point, so the Morse index is one. Now, why am, why am I saying all this? So I have the following theorem due to Berkolaiko. He proved it for, by the way, for discrete graphs and, and quantum graphs. And later on, Colin de Verdier gave another proof for discrete graphs. Uh, and says the following. So if you have a function of the no magnetic uh, graph, uh, and it's generic, then lambda n as a function of alpha has a non-degenerate critical point at alpha equal to zero. And moreover, the Morse index of that point is the nodal surplus. So this weird uh, property, the number of nodal points that we have further than n, actually classify the magnetic stability of the eigenvalue, the magnetic stability of the spectrum. So in this case, I would know that sigma n would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. This, would, this is how the sigma n sequence would look in this situation. And of course, this picture goes to infinity. So this approach is what allows us to find those AJs that I was talking about. So we have some kind of an implicit relation and from this implicit relation, we get the index as a function of the location along the, the location along the manifold. Uh, so we actually get Hessian. We get the Hessian of each eigenvalue. We get a cluster of matrices that are, are real, analyt real analytic on the, uh, on the manifold. And we can talk about uh, the more synthesis and consider just where the Hessian has ne J negative eigenvalue and call it AJ. And the, the latter theorem exactly gives us what we need. And now we just want to explain why AJ is minus A beta minus J. And you can do it using some calculations or you can do it, think about it heuristically. If I'm, ta if I'm doing time reversal symmetry, I'm actually inverting the Hessian. So it's just taking the Hessian and put a minus inside of, in front of the Hessian. And then instead of counting the negative eigenvalues, I'm counting the positive eigenvalues. So that's going from J eigenvalues to beta minus J eigenvalues, negative eigenvalues. So this is, this finished the proof of existence and symmetry. 
how much time do I have? That's like the end of two minutes. So just uh, a sketch of a proof for uh, how do we get the edge separation. So in general, we, we show that whenever we have an edge separating the, a graph into two, then the Hessians are going to be block diagonal. And then we're going to talk about the index of each Hessian separately, which is a local thing. So now we can talk about what happens locally and not globally like the nodal surplus, which is not something that we can relate to a certain part of the graph. And then we, what we're going to do is showing that we can define some kind of a local random variables. These are the local indices that sums up to sigma. Each of them is symmetric with respect to the, the, to the block dimension. And we, will sh we show that these indices are uncorrelated. And from this uncorrelation, it's like we, we have a, a way of flipping each one of them. So if I have this structure, I can keep everything here fixed and keep, take this one and flip it in the, in the sense of the Hessian. So here, the local sigma would be going from 0 to 1. And I can do it along the tree structure to get a binomial distribution. So that's, that's what we do to get the binomial distribution for the edge-separated graphs. For the vertex-separated graphs, it's a totally different story. And there, we actually, instead of looking at the places where the, the fluxes are 0, we look at the entire manifold of fluxes and their critical points. Uh, so that's my talk. Thank you for listening. <laughs>